Today is Tuesday, 15 July 2008. We are at the Isaac Griswold Public Library in Whitehall, New York, and we are interviewing Mr. Martin Kelly, a World War II veteran. Uh, Mr. Kelly, for the record, would you please state your full uh, name and your date and place of birth? Uh, Martin Patrick Kelly, 43025. I was born in New York City. Okay. And um, where did you uh, enter elementary school? Down there or up, well, in, up here? Oh, no, in, in, I lived in New York City all the time. Okay. Uh, St. Stephen's, right around the corner from me, so I couldn't get away from the nuns. If anything happened, they'd come around the corner and tell my mother, so I was a very good student. Okay. Discipline, anyway. Okay. And um, did you graduate from high school? Yes, Harron High, Thomas Harron High. I took a, a preliminary aeronautical engineering. It was the only school in the uh, city that taught that. I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. Fortunately, later on, I flunked out of college doing that and saved the space program because I would have been a terrible space engineer. Okay. And um, what year did you graduate from high school? 43, 1943. 43. Okay. Do you remember where you were? And what you were doing when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yeah, we had just finished a sandlot football game down on the, the east side, a, a playground down on the east side, or a field down on the east side in New York City. And we were coming back carrying all our equipment. Somebody hollered across, they bombed Pearl Harbor. First question to everybody, where's Pearl Harbor or mm -hmm. what's Pearl Harbor? Of course, later on we found out what it was. Mm -hmm. So we were coming from a football game. I was 16, I guess, at the time. Okay. And... Um, when you did enter the service, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, I enlisted, but had to go through the draft. What they had done in '43, they had cut back uh, enlistments for the Marine Corps and, and the Navy because the Army wasn't getting its share. So you had to go through the draft. But what I did, I went down to the Marine Corps headquarters in New York City and told them I was going to be in the May 7th draft and uh, save a place for me. So they sent, sent a postcard, which I did. Now, of course, I lied about my age so I could get in the May 7th draft because if I waited till my birthday, which was April 30th, uh, I wouldn't have made that draft. So, mm -hmm. And all, the, all my buddies were going the same draft. So anyway, that was the story. So when I got through, <clears throat> they were like Grand Central Palace, which is a big ex exhibition hall then down near Grand Central Terminal. And there were about a thousand of us running around from doctor to doctor, all of us wearing a kind of a sad smile and shoes, and that's it. And we went from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. And uh, I remember going to a psychiatrist, to the psychiatrist, and he said, uh, what service you want to be? I said, the Marine Corps. He said, suppose you can't be the Marine Corps. I said, the Army. Well, why not the Navy? Because the Navy was supposed to be very good duty. I said, well, I, I don't like water. Now he leaned in and he said, do you like girls? I said, I like girls, but not in water. As it <laughs> turned out, I got to the Marine Corps, and they had saved the place for me. Uh -huh. And so I got in the Marine Corps. Now uh, what? In a sense, I had to go through the draft in, in that, that time. Okay, now why did you decide on the Marine Corps? I seen <laughs> Wake Island, the movie, and also my older cousin, whom I, I thought was the, the epitome of what a man should be, he had joined the Marine Corps. I, I wrote a letter to him, a card to him, he was, still, he was in the service then, in the Marine Corps, and I, I sent a card to him and I said, uh, I'm joining the Marine Corps. I got down in boot camp and I got a card from him, don't do it. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> but I'm not unhappy that I did it. Now, where did you go for your basic? At Paris Island. Okay, what was that like? Well, it was kind of interesting. I remember we, we all gathered at the uh, headquarters in, in New York when the cat and the parents were all there and uh, we, we signed it in. So, uh, took the pledge, and uh, they couldn't be nicer to us. Oh, and then they took us by bus over to Jersey City to get on the train to go south. And everybody was pretty good. We got to Washington, and we noticed some SPs now on the train, and they were making sure we didn't be too rowdy. We got off the train in Bom uh, well, anyway, a little village outside of uh, Paris Island. We got there, now they had all the DIs and these tough sergeants. And now we were not, no more the guys they patted on the head. Now we were in it. And the thing I noticed eventually in boot camp was 
most of the drill instructors and sergeants were Southerners. They all were, I, I came out of boot camp speaking with a Southern accent practically. Uh, but I realized the Marine Corps are, are you know, in the 20s and 30s, and probably most of it, so a real professional group, and, and, and it drew a lot from the South. Where, where there was a tradition there. I mean, you, you had Northerners, but, but we, a bunch of us now are coming down to New York City, which kind of was a, a, a situation for them too. All these, mm -hmm. they had to pull in the New Yorkers in a sense. Uh, but, and, we, and I guess then they did 42 straight days. We came in and 42 days, straight days later, uh, seven days a week, you came out and you could run through a wall. You know, they said run through a wall. I went in 158 pounds, came out 175. I, I could have licked my weight in wild wildcats, you know, at that mm -hmm. point. And uh, it, was, uh, it was it was in May, in June, and part of July. I remember in July, we were tr training how to crawl with the rifle cradle, cradle in our arms, and we crawl. Now they made us crawl across the parade field. And the parade field was asphalt, and at 110 degrees, you had to you, you crawl and stick and crawl and stick, and then we spent the whole night trying to clean our uniforms. But it was it was a, a discipline. They, they they broke you down and built you up again. It, mm -hmm. was, it was quite a you know we learned the biddle system on the on the uh, uh, bayonets. Instead of this way, you did it this way, and it was a Colonel Bill uh, Biddle who was from the Biddle family in Philadelphia. He had been in the First World War, and he developed this system. It was a much better system. Of, not that I ever had to use a bayonet, but... How, how was it a better system? What, well, what was the you advantage? Could parry, you could parry better. This way, it was to, you had a... This way, if a bayonet's coming, other bayonet's coming at you, or a rifle at it, you, you had a chance to parry it. That okay. way, it still turn. Okay, that's interesting. I had never heard of that yeah, before. Yeah, Colonel Biddle, Biddle. Yeah, he was uh, the Biddle family. From, uh, so, when we got a boot camp, then... Uh, I, I had shot expert on the rifle range. Now, what kind of rifle did you use in basic training? The M1, the Garand. Okay. Yeah, they were, they were well, they, in 1942, they started introducing those. They were using the old Enfields, which you had the cock and load. Uh -huh. But in the um, M1s, of course, you had eight, and they would automatically come into place. So you could fire, well, within less than a minute, you could fire the eight rounds. Mm -hmm. And, of course, on the um, rifle range, you shot from a... 100 yards, 200 yards, 300 yards, and 500 yards. And uh, I had a good drill. I had never fired a gun or a rifle before in my life, which was good because they didn't have to break any bad habits. Mm -hmm. And I had a great drill instructor, a rifle instructor. So I, I fired five, six, well, 312 out of 340. So now they wanted me to go to scout and sniper school because, and, and, or teach down there. Now they knew you go, and then you're the, you're the Lead guy out there tied in a tree somewhere, and I, I not that I wasn't uh, uh, brave enough to do it or whatever, but uh, actually I had, as I said in the high school, I had taken this aeronautical training, so I wanted to get do something with the Air Corps, the air air part of uh, of the Marine Corps. So eventually I was sent to Green um, Cherry Point, North Carolina, where they we were sent to schools. Or from there, it was a we were sent we sent to various schools dealing with the aircraft, and somehow they asked me to want to go into ordnance. I said no, I want to go into mechanic or whatever else. And it turned out I didn't get my school, so they sent me without any training to California, <laughs> where I wound up doing ordnance anyway. But having to learn it by the seat of my pants, so to speak, which meant uh, reloading. Uh, the, uh, oh, I thought I'd never forget these, uh, the, the fighter planes, I should never have forgotten, uh, but I'll come back. Oh, uh, the Corsair? Corsair, thank you, Corsair. And they, uh, so they, you had machine guns, six machine guns, and you had to load mm -hmm. 50 caliber, and then you had a, when we got overseas, then you'd load a 500 pound bomb underneath, so you, and if you had a plane, you were responsible for it, that was it. But you're also a rifleman. You always carried a rifle. Mm -hmm. When you went in, you had to fight your way in and then wait for the planes to come. But uh, so we're in California, and then and we shipped out to Hawaii. Now, what part of California were you in? We were right? around Los Angeles, okay. Anaheim. We, we used to, uh, a day off, we get one day off a week. And 
Was that Camp Pendleton you were at? No, 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 Anaheim. Pendleton yeah. was down in San Diego. Okay. This was a this was an airfield. Actually, an airfield belonged to the Marine Corps. El Toro. El, El, El. Oh, okay. And the uh, we trained there with with a squadron. We were now in a squadron. And I'll never forget the sergeant from Texas. He uh, he got us all into the, uh, the fighter plane course, one man fight in plane, not us obviously. And uh, he got us in this hangar, and he said, "Now here's I want to." And he was teaching us how to get out of a parachute over water. And we're all looking at one another. We're never going to be in a plane. We're not going to be bailing out anywhere. But he spent two or three hours teaching us how to. You know, when you get down about ten feet, you loosen it and drop into the water so the parachute won't come over you. And it sounded reasonable, but I said, "When, the, when am I going to be using a parachute? I, I better not be using a parachute <laughs> if there's one man in the plane." Anyway, uh, he was just. Uh, he never made it overseas with us because he went. He went a little quirky. He had been over in Guadalcanal, so he, he uh -huh. had paid his dues. Uh, so anyway, we went, we shipped out to, uh, to Hawaii, and uh, more training there. And then we shipped to Midway to replace the squadron there, and we spent uh, two months in Midway, which is an experience. <coughs> there were fellows there, the year before they had the Battle of Midway mm -hmm. in 42, and uh, there were still fellows there, the Marines there had been new during the battle. And by this time they, you know, you had goon, what they call goonie birds, which were like albatrosses, which dances all. And then you had the moaning birds, the birds that buried in the sand, they come out at night. So you have to fight your way if you went out at night. And you lived in little sand dunes, a little hut with a sand dune. And so that was your life. Now these guys have been there probably almost two years, some of them. And we met some of them, and I said, you want a drink? Well, they, they were drinking Acrovolva, Acrovolva and Coke. Oh my God. And they don't, the, the PX would only allow one bottle of that revolver a month to them. But, that's, I mean, they, they, I'm sure when they got back from overseas, they had an awful lot of work to be done on them because they, but they had just forgotten them. Now, these, the aircraft squadrons, they were replacing every two months. So then we headed down to uh, Spirito Santos, which was in the New Hebrides. And there we did uh, some final training. And the pilots got a chance to do some fire. They went up uh, to a battle and then they came back and spread the experience was. But it's interesting, down there, when I saw South Pacific, all of a sudden something, the, movie, the musical, several years later, I realized, of course, it, it, was, it was a French territory at one time, and there was this French planter, he had this little plantation, he had cattle, and he was married to a Tonkinese woman, a native woman, and he had children. And so you, for once a month you could sign up and go for five dollars for a steak dinner with wine, French bread, s service, uh, you know, right in the middle of this jungle. And then it dawned on me, James Michener was a Navy lieutenant at the same island at the same time, and he wrote uh, Tales of the South Pacific, which, was mm -hmm. which they made South Pacific. So as soon as I saw the, the planner, I realized that's what we were writing about. Uh, but then we went. Then we went. Then we went up, and uh, we were going to hit Pelo. That was the that was the, the one battle. Uh, so we were, we were going up, and we were now thirty days on the water. They gathered about twenty eight thousand men eventually on the troop ships. Mm -hmm. Now, did you travel with the uh, air squadron? The, the no, they, they sent them north. We, the, eventually, what we had to do when we went to Pelo. We got to the airfield first, and then the squadron came in. Mm -hmm. We had a security airfield. Um, so we got up there and they figured, well, we, we, we had a train. Now, Guadalcanal had been secured. So now we made a, a mock evasion of Guadalcanal, hit the beaches, call the beaches, and at the edge of the, the, the trees, there were guys serving beer and, and uh, sandwiches and everybody else. That was a reward for crawling in the sand. Now, it so happens, the buckle that they would give you for uh, uh, your uniform now, a lot of the guys were out swimming, which I didn't do. I, uh, afterwards, I could swim until we had to go back to the ship and get rid of the sand. I found out the buckle was a good bottle opener. So I was the only one wearing the, practically wearing the uniform at the time, so I was in line, about 30, 40 guys at a time, and I wound up opening beer bottles uh, <laughs> for the guys. Well, we got back on ship, and then we eventually went to uh, uh, Pelolo. Now, our ship was a, a, like a freighter, which was a, a troop ship of sorts. 
But going back, it was going to be a hospital ship. They would bring the wounded back on that ship. Uh, so uh, we finally hit. The, we got to the island, and then on the, on the morning of the invasion, they start the bombardment, and uh, we could hear the the 16-inch rifles from the battleships coming in over your head, and then the cruisers were sending there. They were in close. Every ship, they, they had rocket ships, and they hit everybody. And the first President Bush was the youngest Navy pilot in the, at that time, and he, he flew torpedo, and he was in there, I, I learned later, mm -hmm. dropping torpedoes just to break up the impediments they had in the, uh, in the water. And then the first wave went in, and the second wave, we were going to be in the third wave, uh, because once they got the shore, then we could get to the, hopefully get to the airport, which was about a mile in. It was only two miles by eight miles, the island. Mm -hmm. It so happens, uh, they just did a PBS series on this, on the World War II, and they mentioned the Battle of Peleliu. And I had heard about this earlier, but they confirmed that the battle was never necessary, because at that time, we were supposed to take the island that was 500 miles from the Philippines, so they were going to resupply the people in, when they hit the Philippines, by plane, by transports. But meanwhile, MacArthur had pushed up his schedule and he got, got into the Philippines. So the island wasn't needed. Now we had 28,000 28, men on board ships ready to go in. 8,000 uh, Japanese, very well entrenched. And the, we had a general called General Holland Smith, I guess his name was, Howling Mad they call him. And we also had an Admiral Smith. And between the two of them they said, well we're here, let's go in. It'll only take a couple of days, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, six months later, when I left the island, there were Japanese still in the caves fighting. Mm -hmm. We lost, uh, in the first days, 12, 1,200 men dead, 500 wounded. Okay, now that... Uh, we got the air base. We got to, we got to the air base and secured it and uh, prepared for the planes to come in. Now that was a uh, Japanese base. Uh... It was a Japanese base. Okay. We found out they had given us all kinds of shots, cholera shots, everything else, going into it. We found out the Japanese had been using it as a rest area. It was one of the healthiest islands in the Pacific. It was mainly about I think 15 miles south of the equator uh, in the central Pacific, in the Palau Island group. Um, there was an island further up, about 30, 30 miles north, where 30,000 Japs, Japanese, were uh, quartered, but they just, they were cut off. Mm -hmm. The 8,000 could have been cut off, too. Anyway, uh, we took, took the island, and the last Japanese soldier to surrender did so in about 1968, because mm -hmm. they had this mountain. and. Inside, it was like a regular city. They had, they had horses down there, they had food and ammunition, and they all had gas masks, because they, they feared gas. Actually, what happened, they, we brought napalm in, which is even worse, because it burned up all the oxygen in that case. But what we didn't realize, say, here would be some entrance to the caves, <coughs> and maybe three miles down, there'd be other entrances and exits. So you seal up this, and they'd come out the other way, and very resourceful. They, they held out, well, probably till the end of the war. Most of them they gave up on the area the war was over, but there were still some that, as I say, 20 years later, man, mm -hmm. 65, I guess, came, came out of the caves. Um, so anyway, they, they secured the island, and there was another island across the way that the Army 20, 25th Division went in, but there was no resistance there because all the Japanese soldiers came over to defend mm -hmm. uh, uh, Peleliu. And we took we took that, and there was uh, but there was always a chance that if you're driving a road down to the other end of the island, there was possibly a sniper fire. And once in a while, they'd send a plane down, <laughs> like a seaplane down from the other island, 30 miles away, just to annoy people, wake it, keep everybody awake, and drop a, a couple hundred pound bomb or something on it. But no, that was a Japanese plane. No, Japanese plane, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but they were pretty much uh, secured by that time. Now, now, did they nickname that uh, plane like Washing Machine Charlie? Or yeah, yeah, that was it. Washing okay. Machine Charlie. Yeah, everybody. I guess everybody had a Washing Machine Charlie. <laughs>
It, it just annoys us more than yeah. and, and uh, after a while, you, you'd hear it and you just turn it over. You're supposed to go into your foxhole, but we had pup tents then. And more or less, we'd hear it, we'd turn it over because the guy couldn't hit anything anyway, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, when we're going, oh, when we're going on board ship, I was telling somebody before, we, we were on, on in the New Hebrides and Spirit of Sandra, we, we had a pet, a puppy, we, where we got it from, one of the native dogs that just had a little puppy. So we decided to take it up with us. Now for 30 mm -hmm. days we hid that dog on the boat, on the ship. And now we didn't want to leave it on the ship because, uh, you know, somebody, they throw it overboard, we get rid of it somehow. Yeah. So now going down to Cargan, that's one guy got down to hand the dog, and then another guy got down to hand the dog, and we, we hand the dog, got him in the uh, in the landing barge. So as soon as we hit the shore, we some some firing was going on. The dog was smart; he got out of there, took off down the beach. So we figured, well, we lost our dog. And we, about three months later, I got a a letter from my mother with a clipping from uh, the Daily News a picture. And I show this marine lying in a foxhole sleeping with this dog. And it says, Japanese, Japanese dog befriends marine. It was our dog. <laughs> he, found, he found it at home. See, huh. of course, my mother didn't know where I was because she couldn't, yeah. couldn't tell her, but she said that uh, she didn't realize she was sending to where our dog was. So later on, I told her the dog, and she thought that was a great story. But uh, it, was, it was some of the things, the crazy things that happened. I mean, uh, we would, they would pick, uh, there were CBs on, on, on the island eventually, and there were uh, army personnel, and uh, what they do, they make a, a, a combination guard to guard certain places, like the, um, the, oil, the oil pipes, you'd have to walk the oil pipes to make sure it was secure. So they had one guy up in a, a tower, and there were three oil pipes, so then three of us would walk the oil pipes and come back and report. And if somebody didn't show up, they'd tell the other two, you better find them. Because occasionally the Japanese would try and sneak in and blow up mm -hmm. the oil pipes. And uh, one time a sergeant called and said, hey, so-and-so hasn't reported. Go, go, go walk his, his pipe. Walk his pipe. He was sitting, lying with his head on things, sound asleep. So I woke him up and I said, now, say you got lost, something to it because, I mean, get back there. See. Now later on, they start bringing Navy nurses on board the island, and for the hospital on, on the island. And now the same type of guard was a thing, except they had two, two lines of guards to make sure nobody got into the nurses, not to the, mm -hmm. to the nurses' quarters. I remember uh, an officer, of course, they were the ones that tried to get in, and then they'd say, uh, uh, I'm okay, I'm supposed to, uh, uh, no, 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 no. And we got past, talked its way past me, now he had talked its way past somebody else. And just before we left, they were bringing Coca-Cola in. They bring it in a crate. You buy a you buy a crate, what the twenty-four bottles mm -hmm. for a dollar. They sell it for a dollar. So everybody have a crate under the bunk, and you get up in the morning with you. That was your breakfast. But it's a it. Anyway, now we had they had these piled, probably three stories high, just piled, big thing. Now you had guards on that. You had a guard down there, and then you had a guard sitting on top. I was one time that sitting up on top of, and you, you realize how ridiculous it is, but that was the way he did it, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, the damn thing would disappear. One time they sent me down to the squad, and uh, again assigned pickup. Now they, they would send the, the services would send out these 50-pound boxes of beef, and so we had to load beef and distribute it. Now. We found out early what we were going to do, so we alerted some of the guys in our squadron. So as we were driving along the road, this chief would follow us and we'd throw off a box. So the squadron would have, you know, steaks that night. And uh, you, you got to be a little bit of a crook. <laughs> so, <laughs> or if they transporting ice cream, everybody would eat ice cream. That's when, that's when the island was really secured. You knew you, know, you had no reason being there anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I was sent back then, I flew from Peleliu to Guam, and we stayed there for a couple of days, and then flew directly to Hawaii. Now I was on this plane, this, well DC-3 was what it, what it was, and 
you know, offices and everything. I was the lowest ranked guy, I was PFC, lowest ranked guy in a plane, but I had to sit on the floor. Uh, and uh, it landed at Johnson, it landed at Johnson Island, remember? I never thought of land, you come in in low because it's a short strip and you figure, this is not a seaplane, but it landed. Then we went, we went to uh, uh, Oahu, the uh, Honolulu, where we stayed for about three weeks before we were sent back. To, and we went back on ship for it to, to uh, San Francisco. I hit San Francisco the day Iwo Jima was hit. And I remember uh, my, I had, my, my parents hadn't heard from me for about a month because we couldn't mail anything. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, my mother had a phone at that time, but I figured if I call her, she may get, because she, you know, think unfortunately the darker thoughts. So I called my cousin who called her and said, I'm in San Francisco, I'm okay, bingo. So uh, then we went to San Diego, and then finally they put us on board uh, on a uh, troop train to go to uh, eventually New York or for furlough, 30 day furlough. Now, we, we, we went through, it took a long one, went through Texas, and going through Texas made one stop. Now this was maybe 10 cars were uh, service, service people, uh, mostly Marines, uh, sleeping cars, and then there were about three or four civilian cars. When they let us off in Texas, everybody headed for the nearest liquor store. And, uh, but then the one sergeant said, no, you got to watch it, you can't carry it. What you do, you get pints and you put it in your sock, put it in your socks and tape it. And then you walk, walk naturally into the, to the train. Well, we get there to find out the SPs knew all this, so they'd, they'd get their baton and just bing, 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 and you got, then you got two socks full of broken glass. <laughs> One of, these, one of the sergeants who had been around a long, so what he did, he got one of the, uh, an elderly woman from the civilian train and said, uh, will you hire a porter for me? He said, yeah. The porter carried a case of liquor on for this little old woman. See? And later on, they came back when the train started and they had quarts of liquor. Uh, it was, survivorship was a real, mm -hmm. a real t a talent you learn pretty soon. Now we're going through, on the way home, we're going through, uh, we're going to go into St. Louis. I'm going to stop over at St. Louis. Now, nobody told us this was a, a, a coal, a, coal a, a diesel, or it had smoke train, obviously. And all, there was a mile long tunnel before you got to St. Louis. Now, everybody had the, their windows open, there was no air conditioning, the beds were all made. And uh, now we go in, now smoke came in. We could have done a minstrel show when we were finished. So we washed up, we get, now you, they get, there were 300 on the train, they said, okay. You got three hours liberty, which was the stupidest thing they could have said. Anyway, 300 guys take off, and when when the train was ready to go, there were 600 people in the station. 300 guys, 300 girls. The guys wanted their they wanted their papers right there so they could get married. It was crazy. I mean, it took them about an hour to get everybody separated and get them on a train. But uh, I remember though another thing in train is it's strange. The attitude of people during the war, uh, we were going across country, we were going through the northern route, through New or uh, through Indiana and Il Illinois, whichever comes first. And they stopped in this little town, a little village, and women and, ch and girls got on, on the train passing out donuts, sandwiches, <coughs> and, you know, wonderful. And so we had good, about 50 miles down the line, we stopped again, and another group got on. And for about 100 miles, with the best fed troops going. Uh, and, and, but I, I remember in, in, when I was in California, uh, what you do, we were stationed there, we were going to, we were going to travel uh, to Los Angeles from where we were, it's about 25 miles or so, uh, we'd hitchhike. And you're no problem, you, your uniform, you get picked up. And I remember this young couple picked us up, uh, picked me up. Uh, you know, about seven o'clock at night or something like that, and uh, they wanted to buy me dinner. I said, "No, no, no we can buy dinner." Said, <coughs> <coughs> well, her husband had been declared for that that day, and uh, they just <coughs> they just felt they owed somebody something. But <coughs> generally, it, it was so different because. As most people who lived through that would tell you, uh, you had
had the whole country behind you. You mm -hmm. knew that. You know. Um, so unlike the past, Korea was something like that. Vietnam certainly wasn't, and certainly this war, you don't have that. Uh, but I guess it was a war that was our true world war, mm -hmm. and there was and we got bombed and everything else. But uh, and we could go over there to make sure they didn't come here. Mm -hmm. It's a little different nowadays, unfortunately. Let me just say, uh, just going back a little bit, when yeah. when you were in the South Pacific, did you suffer from any sort of uh, diseases like? Uh, was malaria a problem, dengue fever? Or? No, none of that. What I suffered from is ingrown toenails. <laughs> I went in boot camp, and of course in boot camp, once you get in there, you know you, you're nothing, and you don't discuss any of your arguments. So they, they were throwing the clothes at What size? Yeah, you okay? And I, I wore a size 10 and a half then because <laughs> I have a wide foot, and 10 and a half fit me. 9 and a half was my true size, but so I said 10 and a half. No, nah, you look 90. Well, it was too tight. To, so I wound up by the end of boot camp with these my big toes ingrown. And it wasn't until I got to uh, Hawaii that they really were in bad shape. Mm -hmm. And the doctor saw it. He said, well, we got to, then they'd try and clip away a little, a little. And I, so they put me in the sick bay in Hawaii to see if they could clean it up. And, you know, so my our doctor, who was a, a bit of a screwball, but a great guy, he came in and he said, uh, you know, the outfit's going to Midway tomorrow. I said, yeah. He said, you want to go? I said, yeah, but how am I going to go? I'm in the hospital. He said, are you a stout fellow? What did so happen? Our CEO was a fellow named Stout. So I figured, are you a Rogers Ranger? Are you this? I said, yeah, I'm a stout fellow. Hold on to the, t hold on to the bed. And he did that, and he yanked the both toenails off with a pliers. Oh, God. <laughs> well, the next day I was on board ship. I mean. It, it, fine, but they grew back then. <laughs> so I had them done in New Hebrides and then in Peleliu after we secured. Well, they're still in the, in the hills, maybe from here, the across the canal. Um, across the canal. Uh, they came up again, and so now we are, now we're in a tent, and uh, this Navy doctor was going to operate. I was, he said, "Well, we got to do something." He said, "I'll tell you what to do. I'll, he said, you know, it'd be easier if I just took the toe off of the first joint." Fortunately, I was still awake, and I said, I don't think so. Well, or right, it's right. So he, I had one corpsman giving needles, one corpsman keeping flies away, and the other corpsman handing the utensils to the, the, the doctor. And eventually, he cut away the nerve, whatever. He, it's, it's pretty good. I got out of the service. I still got the same problem. So I I'll go to the VA. Go get treatment that way. Well, then you got to sign out. you got you got to apply for a pension. I said, I don't want a pension. I just, you know. It happened in the service, can you fix it? So I had to apply for a pension. I applied for a pension, so they sent back disable 0%. That meant I could get treatment. Well, by that time, I had a private doctor working on it. So that plagued me for about eight, nine years afterwards. I mean, that, that that's it sounds silly, but mm -hmm. it's one of those crazy things. But I wanted more stories about it. The, the, uh, but anyway, now when I'm going to school, I'm going to college in, in Washington, and they... Uh, at any point, you go on a part-time job, you go downtown Washington, this is in the early 50s, and you can take a test, typing test or a clerk test, and get a job somewhere in one of the departments. Well, of course, now I had 10 points for uh, being a disabled veteran, and I had, so I got 96 on 10, I wanted about 100, 106 on a test, so every agency in Washington wanted me, so I could take my jobs. Mm -hmm. So, in the, in the craziness, that's... Uh, but as I said in college, the, the one good thing out of it, well, besides some decent memories, is I got, I, I spent 30 months in the, 30 months in the service, all to, all to all. I wound up getting seven years of college out of it. Mm -hmm. One year of engineering school, which, uh, as I say, for the sake of the space program, I flunked, fortunately. <laughs> but then the VA at that point could have said that that's it, you had your shot. But they didn't. Uh, they sent me to NYU, New York University, the testing, and they tested me for two weeks. And they said, well, here's, you got to write. You got to write. That's what you got to do. And you do it. engineering was down about 14. And uh, so they, they said, get a, go to a four-year liberal arts college, take English, and get a job in a newspaper. 
So I, I moved up. A friend of mine was living in Albany, and uh, Siena College at that time was a uh, just beginning to enlarge. And I got in there, and then about three months later, two months later, I got a job on a newspaper as a copy boy, which is an office boy. What newspaper was that? Times Union, Albany okay. Times Union. Uh, so then, at that point, so I spent 28 years eventually at the Times Union, among other places. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I say, I went to one year engineering school, four years of liberal arts, two years of graduate school, and it cost me $45. Now, do you think if it hadn't have been for your military service, you would have gone on to college? I would have tried, certainly, but you know what, my, you know, we were, my, my, my parents were immigrants, my father was illiterate, couldn't read or write, he was a laborer mm -hmm. when he could work, and they were certainly all for school, but I, I, I would hope I could, could have worked my way through, but no, I, much, I couldn't answer that. Mm -hmm. But I, I had the best of the whole thing, and I'm still, you know, I'm 83 years old now, <coughs> I'm still benefiting. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm up here working with these people, you know, and, and enjoying it. Okay. I'm lucky, really lucky. Okay, let me just go back uh, a little bit. Uh, sure. Now, did you uh, ever get to see any USO shows while you were overseas? Yeah, we, uh, well, in, in, over in Hollywood, we'd see, uh, uh, you go to the Hollywood Canteen, of course, and I remember Hedy Lamar was behind the, the counter of serving soft drinks, and I got talking with her, and all of a sudden, John, well, she was married to John Lowe at the time, John Lowe sidles up, so I figured, well, I'm not going to go anywhere there. But no, they had, they had shows, yeah, they, they had USO shows. Mm -hmm. I remember one time they did it when we were down in Hebrides. The Army, Army used to put together little units. And they had this, uh, come on stage, and this beautiful blonde hush. Oh, unbelievable. And, we, and of course, he was a male. And, and, but looked right. everybody had to go backstage to make sure that it really wasn't a girl because <laughs> sneak, trying to sneak a girl past us. But they used to have the Hoof Gibson movies. Hop along Cassidy, Hoop Gibson, and every other night, they'd have movies every night in this thing, uh, just to keep you out of harm's way. Uh, and we'd, 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 have, we'd appoint a detail to, to clean up all the shelves after the game thing. It, was, it got so ridiculous. We'd know the dialogue or we'd break the battle. But entertainment. And we formed a baseball team in Hebrides, and I was, I was catcher. We had no equipment, so we went to the Red Cross, and they gave me this catcher's mitt. So the ball hits, the stuffing came out, and I put the stuffing back, throw the ball back. So. And uh, we had on our team a fellow who had been in a high Detroit farm, farm team, a pitcher, big, big guy. And he, he'd throw and knock me back two feet every time I'd catch the ball. And we, we played an Australian team. There was an Australian unit down, down the heavens at the time, and they put together. So I remember one time, Going after a pop fly, walk on, going over near the, the bench where the Australians were, and all of a sudden the sky disappeared. I mean, there was a shell hole there that which they never told me about, and I went right down. And, you know, they just laughed at their heads off the, the yanking in the hole. You know, so. But uh, I, I I have to say, for many reasons, I, I'm glad I, I was able to serve. Mm -hmm. My brother followed me into the Marine Corps. He went into, he was in Korea. He was five years younger. And, uh, and probably because the same reason I went, because my cousin went in. You know, we, neither one of us had, had, had a son, so we probably, we ended the tradition there, I suppose. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the story. Okay. Now let me just ask you this. Uh, <clears throat> do you remember the uh, television show back in the 1970s, The Black Sheep Squadron with oh, yeah, 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 Robert yeah, yeah. Conrad? That was, was, was that anything like yeah, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, life yeah. there? They, they had, they had uh, uh, Boynton, uh, Boynton was the, was the uh, he was playing Boynton, mm -hmm. who was the uh, ace. He had mm -hmm. 25 planes shot down. The most any of ours had were, I think, 11. Mm -hmm. That included Guadalcanal and Pelotu. Because they didn't have that many Japanese planes in the air then. Uh, yeah, boy, yeah, it was a, it was very, very, very close. I mean, uh, unfortunately, it didn't last long. But but those people, I think, by that time just didn't want to be, because it, it Nash went because they had a comic view of it, mm -hmm. and and Korea was a little more current. But uh, no, that you're right. I, I forget all about that. Yeah, that was Boyington. He was the he was the hero. One time, we were in Hebrides. 
and truck was the big naval base for, for Japanese, big naval base. And they were never going to attack it because it, it, it wasn't worth it because you could go around them. But every once in a while, the Japanese Navy would come out of there and bother some, so they kept try to keep it contained. So now, in the Hebrides, in, in this way, it was like, it was, one of us was a coconut plantation, a regular plantation. So you had to watch, always had to wear your helmet when you went to the John, and, uh, because coconut may fall. And uh, now the Johns were like four seaters, two backed up, two in each. So it got very close or intimate, so to speak. So one time, another fellow and I, we, we, we said, before we went, let's start a rumor. So we started. Marines had, and the Navy had hit truck. Big air battle. Boynton had shot down 10 more planes. And then there was Joe Force, he was another one, another race. He, had, he got shot down there. And they, we made this big story. Now we waited. Now this was like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So by the time we got to dinner in the mess hall, that story was all over. And embellished, of course, you know. And it, the rumors were great. <laughs> Of course, we lost that particular job because the way they, the only way you clean it, you put gasoline, a little gasoline, and then light it. See, that would, and of course, one guy got a little too ambitious, too much gasoline, and our outhouse burned down. So. Um, after you got out of the service, did you stay in contact with anyone you knew? A few, a few. Uh, what, the reason I'm up here, uh, eventually, but this fellow I met in boot camp, his name was also Kelly. So they'd be old if we get the wrong mail. And, mm -hmm. in, and I got to know his family. I'd, I'd write to his family and things like that. And uh, so after the war, no, we separated. We, we after boot camp, we went well, after, yeah, after boot camp, we were in different directions. And uh, he, uh, uh, but we kept in contact. And I kept in contact with his family. He had two young, he had a young brother and a sister, and they, they would write, you know, write the mm -hmm. servicemen type of thing. When I got a boot camp, well, after I flunked out of engineering school, I, uh, he, he called me, he said, why don't you go up here to Siena, they, they, they begin to enlarge. And uh, at that particular year I went in, 400 people out of New York City came, came in. And, uh, but anyway, so I came up here and I, I, was, I lived with their family for about a year. And they still, two of them are priests now, I still have in contact with them. Unfortunately my buddy died about 15 years ago. But uh, that's, that's the one thing out of the service. And who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, and you asked the question before about would you have done it on your own? I, I would like to think so, but here I had help. I, so mm -hmm. First of all, the government, paying full freight. Like what you did in those days, you got a month for every month you served, a month of college. Now, a month of college was actually, so nine months was like a year, in a sense, the way they, the way they broke it up. And then I, I, the state gave out the same, same thing except half work. They give up uh, like the equivalent of four half years, and I won one of those in my junior year. So I saved my GI bills because I was going to go out of the state, and I couldn't take the New York one out of the mm -hmm. state. I was going to Washington to go to school. So as I say, I spent I had seven years of college for forty five dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they don't owe me a thing. All right. Well. Anything else you'd like to add? I think I've talked too much. I All appreciate right. this. All right, well, thank you so much for okay. your interview. You're welcome. You're welcome. The platoon leader, a second lieutenant, uh, who won in every tank, more or less. So you were accepted for officer candidate yeah, yeah, school? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, I figured at that time, it was five months training instead of three. It was five months, so I figured uh, September, October, November, December, January, and they were going to hit, I guess, Japan in April. That was the original plan. I figured, and the odds were, I think, five to one, girls to men in Washington at the time, so I figured I might have a shot at least having some <laughs> entertainment, you know. <laughs> but they dropped the bombs, and that was it. Well, fortunately, they saved millions of lives, millions of lives. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks okay. again. Bye.